I'm University of Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. Nutrition and management of the dry dairy cow has been an area of extensive research across the whole of the land-grant system in the United States, and researchers say this is one of the most critical and stressful phases of the lactation cycle. Phil Cardoso, University of Illinois Extension specialist in dairy, now joins us to take up this area. He's written an article that outlines 10 steps for a successful transition period. Thanks for being here. Let's take up the first five steps in this process, and we'll come back to the second five at a later time. Why is it that this particular period is so important, and how long has it been studied? This has been studied for more than 25 years, uh, and we all recognize as an industry that that period is the period where most of the problems with cows start happening. So usually we talk about metabolic disorders. So most of the diseases that are going to have a very serious economic impact on the dairy farm and the dairy farm profitability are happening on those in that period. And it's pretty much uh, the period where we have a cow that she's pregnant, she's not giving milk, and then one day she gives birth and the next day she's producing sometimes 80, 60 pounds of milk and now she has a calf uh, on the ground that can weigh 80, 90 pounds. So that's a huge, huge uh, um, task to, to take for the cow. And so there are some cows that can adapt better to that depending on uh, also the environment and that means the farm they are, the type of nutrition, uh, the type of management they have uh, that can be alleviated or not. So we've been talking for more than 25 years about this. And uh, what we try to come up here is some simple steps that a farmer just can ask, hey, am I doing okay on my transition period program? Are my cows doing okay? Are they doing good? So we came up with uh, 10 steps that they can figure out where they are in relationship to their transition cow program, if more important, are there areas of opportunity for them on that period? We're gonna take up the first five, but you start with some University of Wisconsin work, I think, uh, that takes a look at the environment that the cow is in. Uh, and they called for a special needs barn. Yeah, that's, that's very uh, interesting coming from Madison, Wisconsin, is that the same thing when we talk about, you know, NFL and football teams having the uh, special teams and they have that specific uh, task to take. We would have barns developed just to give more comfort to those cows during that uh, the transition period. So it would have, uh, of course, less cow per area. So we don't have the overcrowding that sometimes we can have. Uh, cows would have more space at the bunk to eat. They would have a bed that perhaps a little bit more comfortable since they have that calf or they are in that uh, transition period. Uh, so that's one of the things that we acknowledge in most of the farms. Uh, they are going that way. They're giving a little bit more attention to those cows during the transition period, even developing buildings and facilities for that reason. So you've written an article about this, and folks can, I'm sure, look it up. Each of the steps uh, has really kind of one point in them. Point one is DMI, or uh, dry matter intake. Yeah, so I think that's one of the most important things that we can do in our farms. And I know that folks out there, they have a really hard time doing that. It's not easy at times. And my challenge always is, okay, if you cannot do every day, how about doing every week or how about doing every month? But at least we have an idea on how much nutrients our cows are getting. So the DMI, the dry matter intake, is just taking out the water out of the whole feed that the cow is consuming. Usually we call that a total mix ration or a TMR. And we can have an idea on how much they're eating before calving and after calving. We can have an idea on how many metabolic disorders they're gonna be more prone to have. So we know that cows that eat well before and after calving, they're gonna have a healthier lactation. They're gonna produce more milk and farmers are gonna have more profitability in the end. So having a way of 
assessing dry matter intake, talking to your nutritionist, saying, hey, these cows, they are supposed to eating 50, 52 pounds, 25 pounds. It depends a little bit on the week uh, in the lactation, but make sure that your cows are achieving that minimum intake. Uh, that's one of my first suggestions because we know that intake is related with milk production. Tell me about the body condition score as it relates to the dairy cow before and after uh, they give birth. Yeah, so one of the ways that what we usually know that happens is that after calving the cow, she cannot get as much energy as she needs from the feed because she is stressed, the intake is not as high as she needs. So what end up, she needs to take that energy out of somewhere. And like all, most of all the species, what end up is that they start burning the adipose tissue to generate that extra energy. Uh, so if cows, they don't eat well, what's going to happen is that they need to get that energy from somewhere. They end up getting for their own reserves. And we know that if they do that too much, that's going to be very, very detrimental for her health. And she's not going to be producing as much milk or she's not going to be a healthy cow and a happy cow. So we want to limit that, and I know it's very difficult to, we go in a body condition score from one to five. We want that transition from uh, a dry period to after calving or until we breed her throughout the whole lactation that stays around 0 0.5 or 0.75. If we are having cows losing more than one body condition score or having a more than one body condition score change, that ends up uh, leading cows to get more sick. So the DMI and the body condition score would be related because we have dry matter intake, right? Exactly. Uh, and, and then the next step, or step three in this five-step process of the total of 10, is the BHB. What does that stand for? Yeah. So that's one of the ketone bodies, and that is the Bactra hydroxybutyrate. Most of the farms now, they know this little... Uh, device uh, that we can collect a little uh, uh, drop of blood from the cow in the two, uh, first or second week in lactation and we can have a number and we know that cows that are over 1.2 uh, they may be more prone to be developing ketosis and other diseases as well so it's a way easy way that farmers can go that tomorrow there tomorrow collect the blood from some of those cows and see where are they at? If the cows there are with a high level, that means they have subclinical ketosis. They are more prone to have other problems, and that means they are not eating as well. And that can mean that they are losing too much body condition score. So it's just like we are checking several steps uh, to see if that cow is transitioning well. If she's eating as much as she wants, she's not going to be losing body condition score. And by not using that post tissue, those ketone bodies that kind of try to substitute glucose, they are there because of that. Am I understanding this correctly, that this is a type of diabetes? Yeah, I mean, during the gestation, so the cow, she's not producing milk. So, so the energy that she needs, it's, it's, it, it, it's not enough. So she eats well, she usually doesn't have any ketosis. Uh, however, after calving, because she's producing usually a lot of milk and not eating well, uh, that relates a little bit with this diabetes concept. And actually, some of these devices, they are the same ones that people with diabetes, they are checking their glucose or ketone body levels. Yeah. Tell me about milk fever. That's one of the things that I think the dairy industry work really well in developing some diets that we can use before calving that allow cows not to have milk fever or pretty much uh, low calcium in the blood after they calve. Like I said, a lot of milk is being produced. A lot of calcium is going away. Cows need to have an easy way to assess that calcium from the bone matrix, the matrix. So by using uh, the difference CAD and I difference, those diets with a low DCAD, uh, we help cows to lower their body pH and therefore calcium can be extracted in an easier way from the cow after she calves. And you can assess that by just after we start feeding this diet, usually three weeks before calving, by five or, or five days or even less, we can check that the urine pH goes down. 
That means that the whole body of the cow is, we can say, acidified, and that helps her to get calcium out of the bones after calving. And finally, step five of this 10-step process you've been talking about, but this is the last one for this particular piece, um, is fairly simple. It's about number of cows that are called. If we do everything right, cows should stay in our herd for a long time. So as the transition period is so important and bringing some, most of the diseases, we can measure in the first 60 days after calving how many cows are going away from your herd, voluntary or involuntary. And that's the percentage that we want to keep below 8%. If we are having to cool cows because they simply die or because they get so sick that we need to get rid of them, if that happens in more than 80% of the calvings you're having, that means that we are losing too many cows. We're going to have to spend a lot of money to bring new animals to your herd to keep, keep with the milk production. So if everything goes well, your cows should be staying in the herd. Phil, thanks so much. Thank you. Phil Cardozo is an extension specialist in dairy here on the Urbana-Champaign campus of the University of Illinois. Illinois.